part two of a lecture looking at language and power in Richard III. So let us ask, who is Richard? And look at what he tells us. In his first soliloquy, he goes on at some length to talk about his own deformity, his physical ugliness. He calls himself rudely stamped, cheated of feature, deformed, and unfinished. And all of these things make him unfit for the period in which he's living, unfit for his time. He was sent before his time. He's unfashionable. He cannot match. He's not fit for the weak piping time of peace or the well, fair, well-spoken days. So he hates the idle pleasures of these days. So this is what Richard tells us about himself, that he's unformed, deformed, and doesn't fit with the times. Let's pause to consider this description of Richard's deformity a bit more closely. He says he's unfinished, he's lacking, he is missing something in his nature. And of course, lack is what feeds desire. We need something, we, we lack something that we want, and we reach for it in order to fulfill ourselves. And he is deformed, that is, without form, unformed or formless. That's literally what it means to be deformed. So without shape, he can take any shape. And we notice, of course, that that is what Richard does. He takes different shapes. He is a performer. And he is marked by his ugliness, both by those outside of him. He says that dogs bark at him as he passes by. But he is also marked by himself. He notices his own shadow, and he sees in the shadow that he casts his own ugliness and deformity. So he's marked by his own eye. He sees himself in this way. And this is part of what allows him to take so many different shapes, is that he knows his own deformity. So Richard is what we would call a monster. And he fulfills this definition both in the literal sense of a misshapen, ugly creature, and in the figurative sense of one who behaves cruelly or monstrously to others. And let's consider the root of the word monster. It's from the word, the Latin words that mean to show and to warn. And in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, people who were called monsters or, quote, freaks or prodigies, that is, anyone who had an obvious physical disability or deformity, some sort of notable birth defect, anything that marked their bodies out as different, any physical affliction, these were viewed as signs or omens, divine messages. So they showed something of God's truth, of God's will. But what that will was, what exactly God meant in those signs, was up for grabs. It could be interpreted any number of ways, depending on who's doing the interpreting and what the context is. It could be viewed as a sign of that person's inner sinfulness. It could be an affliction meant to humble that person. It could be an affliction meant to humble that person's parents or as punishment for the parents' sins. So what the body meant was nebulous, mysterious, ambiguous. So we have a cause and effect issue. Richard sees himself as different, as out of time and place. And is this because his body thus misshapes his soul, his mind? Or does his mind, is he already an evil person that is thus reflected in his body? Is he a rebel against his time and, and place because he hates these people? Or because they hate him, because he has been rejected? It gives us a very problematic issue. Who is speaking? Who is causing the evil in this? We blame Richard, but where exactly does Richard's evil come from? And so Richard speaks himself into being. It is through his words that Richard creates himself, as we've seen. His ability to play with imagery and to be so persuasive and seductive and subtle in his speech. And here's a prime example when he's wooing Lady Anne, whom, again, he has murdered her father-in-law and husband, and he woos her. And as she, he is starting to convince her that he is not the murderer that he appears to be, he's not the murderer that he's actually acted as in the past, she says, I would I knew thy heart. Because, of course, how can you see one's heart, the center of one's being? the inner organ that is a symbol for, a figure for, one's soul, or goodness, or truth. And Richard says, "'Tis figured in my tongue." He, that is, he is speaking it. He is figuring it in his tongue, showing his heart by the way he speaks. 
And this word figure, well, what is a figure? A figure is a form, a shape, an appearance, a body. A figure can be a person. A figure can refer to one's status. A figure is a symbol or representation or a metaphor. And to figure something is to give something form, to give something shape, to create, to trace or mark. Also to think about or calculate, to represent or to make a representation of, to create a metaphor, to understand. These are all meanings that Richard is evoking when he says he figures himself in his tongue. Because, of course, Richard is disfigured. He is without form. He is without shape. So he must figure himself. He presents himself. He gives himself a form or shape as, now, in this moment, the wooing lover. He represents himself in a way that is, of course, false. It is a metaphor. It is a figure that hides the disfigurement underneath. He creates himself into Richard the king. He makes himself into something else through his speech. And Richard figures himself to the public as simple, innocent, plain. And to us, we see the duplicity, the disfigurement. He calls himself too childish, foolish for this world. That is, he's too much like a child to understand the deceptions of others. And he says that he will, as a child, go by thy direction. He's following others. He doesn't have deception within him. He is simple, he says. And it's interesting that he compares himself to a child because the word infant comes from the Latin for unable to speak. So this man who speaks subtly and tricks others with his words says, I am just a child who cannot speak. Well, of course, he tells us that he clothes his naked villainy and seems a saint when most he plays the devil. He has an outer layer that hides an inner layer, an inner truth. And like the formal vice that is the actor, the, the villainous characters in the old morality plays, he moralizes two meanings in one word. His language means more than it appears. So we see that Richard figures himself in different ways depending on who he's talking to. And a very interesting line when he's talking to his uh, nephews who, of whom he's going to kill, he says first to them, No more can you distinguish of a man than of his outward show, which God, he knows, seldom or never jumpeth with the heart. That is, you can't tell anyone except by what they show to you by their appearance. And we know that appearance often does not match with the inner truth. And this is such a complex line coming from Richard because, of course, he is here pretending to be good, appearing to be good, while we know that he secretly plans to execute his nephew in order to solidify his hold on the throne. Yet also, Richard appears evil and from the perspective of his body, and that does match with his heart, or again, does it? So Richard here is sort of speaking the truth while lying. He tells us that we cannot necessarily be sure of appearances, and yet he himself has remarked on his appearance as being a sign of truth. To take this a step further, in Act 3, Scene 4, Richard goes so far as to accuse his enemies of bewitching him and blames his bodily deformity on his brother's wife and his brother's mistress. He says that their witchcraft has given him his blasted arm, withered his arm, given him his hunchback, etc., etc. Now, this is obviously patently ridiculous to blame people for something recently which he's had since birth to say, they just did this to me when everyone knows this has been the way Richard has always been. And it's not perhaps so much that he really convinces them that this is a believable story, but that he points out, even though he is lying in this instant, he points out how the body itself is always subject to description, interpretation. That the interpretation of his body as being showing some inner evil is perhaps just as ridiculous, just as false, as the idea that his body betrays the evils of others. That is, he makes his body not the sign of his own evil, but the sign of others' evil. And this takes us back to that question, what is it that causes Richard to be an outsider? Is his physical deformity the cause? Is it the result? Is it a sign of his evil? Is it something that is projected on him, or is evil something that is projected on him by others?
So again, this is a, a, a ridiculous claim. It's just another sign of Richard lying. But in lying, Richard always tells something of the truth. He always shows us some reality that the sinfulness that is that marks him, the evil that his body supposedly displays, is not necessarily or cannot be fully internally generated, that that evil must come from somewhere outside as well. What happens when Richard becomes king? In Act 4, Scene 2, he has this exchange with Buckingham, who has been his most loyal servant thus far. He says, Why, Buckingham, I say I would be king. Why, so you are, my thrice-renowned liege. Ha! Am I king? Tis so, but Edward lives, Edward being his nephew. Then he goes on, Shall I be plain, I wish the bastards dead, and I would have it suddenly performed. What sayest thou? Speak, suddenly, be brief. And Buckingham responds, Your grace may do your pleasure. Now notice what happens here. Richard says, I want to be king, and Buckingham says, You are, and he responds with a question. And is this question, how much is Richard really perhaps asking this? Does he even recognize himself yet as king? And notice that he still has this desire, but Buckingham says, you can fulfill your desire. You are the king. You can do what you want now. By becoming king, Richard has moved from the margins to the center. And at the center, he can no longer play. He can no longer be whatever he wants to be, but he has the entire system now weighing on him. And we can think about the figure of the monarch. The monarch is, of course, a symbol, but it's a sim the monarch is a symbol of God's authority. So the monarch is a symbol that is identical to God, but also sort of self-identical. That is, the monarch is the monarch. The king is the king, just as God is God. Where Richard can be whatever he wants, as the king, he can only be the king. There's a certain shallowness to that representation, to that symbol. And then, of course, as king, his desires can be immediately fulfilled. And Richard seems to run on desire, as all humans do. And once he can be fulfilled so easily, his desires become almost meaningless. They become less satisfactory to him. So Richard as king can no longer be the playful, seductive, misleading performer that he has been as Richard of Gloucester. He now must be the king, and it's this inability to perform. It's this role that he's desired, but that has in some sense now been forced upon him that limits him and is ultimately what dooms him. And so Richard begins to unravel. As he wakes from a dream on the night before the final battle, his soliloquy is vastly different from the soliloquy that opened the play, where he had been smooth and fluid, confidently expressing different oppositions and melding one into the other. Here, his language is staccato. His rhythms are choppy and interrupted. He's confused rather than smoothly aligning one is opposition to another, he's confused about himself, his own identity, and that he fears himself. He doesn't know himself. He doesn't know what he will do to himself or even how he feels about himself. And as he says, my conscience hath a thousand several tongues, and every tongue brings in a several tale, and every tale condemns me for a villain. So it is as though all the different identities, all the different roles that Richard has played are coming back to haunt him, just as the ghosts of those he has murdered have come back to haunt him. So where do Richard's thousand tongues of conscience come from? Well, they come from his depth of character. He says at the close of his opening soliloquy, as his brother Clarence approaches, dive thoughts down to my soul. He hides the truth within him. He has that depth of personality. And it's that depth that is what makes him Richard and what makes him so compelling as a character and what makes him so seductive and powerful as a performer. But it's also that depth that destroys him because it's from within those depths that his own evil and his own guilt at being evil strikes out at him. And this is in contrast to Richmond, the hero of the play, whom 
Richard describes near the end as shallow Richmond, this insult of Richard's shallowness. But it is Richmond's shallowness that makes him a good king, or that will make him a good king, that makes him the hero. It is Richmond who becomes Henry VII, the founder of the Tudor dynasty. And it's his shallowness, the fact that as a character in this play, he doesn't have many lines, he doesn't have much personality, there's not much to suggest a way of inner motivation. But it's that simplicity that makes him good as a king, because he's nothing but then the king. He doesn't have the duplicitous inner depths that Richard has. And ironically, it's Richmond's shallowness that makes him almost exchangeable. Richard says, I think there be six Richmonds in the field. Five have I slain today instead of him. Richmond is so shallow that one can easily mistake any number of people for him. Of course, he is the one also then who will be marked out to be king, whereas Richard is deformed, marked out, instantly notable. And it's that notability, of course, is a sign of his, or is the product of his, depth of character. So this interesting irony of the depth, what makes Richard, in fact, more human than Richmond as a character, and more interesting as a character in the play, is what makes him evil. So let's end by looking at a passage from a very famous Renaissance text called A Fable About Man. In this fable, it's a story of Jupiter, the king of the gods, throwing a birthday party for his wife, Juno. And Jupiter arranges for a number of plays for his fellow divine companions. And as they're watching these plays, they all agree that man, that humanity, is the best performer. And man's performance is described like so. Verily, man, peering oft through the mask which hides him, would change himself so as to appear under the mask of a plant, or into the shapes of a thousand wild beasts. He returned as a man, prudent, just, faithful, human, kindly, and friendly. And then the gods were not expecting to see him in more shapes, when, behold, he was remade into one of their own race, surpassing the nature of man. This was written by Juan Luis Vives, who was a Spanish educator and humanist and the tutor to Queen Mary I. And this is intended as a celebration of humanity's capability, that humans are capable of such great things, of rising beyond their mere humanity, their mere animality. And this is taken in many ways to be one of the central ideas of the Renaissance, that humans are more than just animals, that we are capable of great things, that humans are worth are worthy beings but it of course raises the question if we are just actors if humans are always wearing a mask even when we're being humans and if we can be more than what we are then what really is the root where is our root who speaks who is the performer that does this performance is there a being that is there before it is called into being is richard evil before he acts as richard is that evil a part of his core identity, or is it something that is crafted, that is created, that is performed? And again, who is the performer at the root of the performance? And this is, of course, a key question for Shakespeare, as himself an actor, as someone working in the theater, where everyone is being something that they're not. To be an actor is to be someone else. That is your job, to not be yourself, or to be yourself as someone else. So, essentially, what I'm getting at is that in this play, Shakespeare is raising the question, who speaks when I speak? Who speaks when Richard speaks? What's the core upon which our identity is built, if there is one? Are we anything more than just actors? Is there anything there before we act? And so, in some way, Richard, despite his evil, is thus the quintessential Renaissance man, or the quintessential human in general. He is someone that performs, someone that's brought into being by his society and takes full ownership of it as much as he can until ultimately that performance ends and he's destroyed.